afternoon, colleagues, friends. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm really delighted to see um, old and new friends in the room today. Um, it's really my um, great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Vittorio Galese, uh, full professor of human physiology from the University of Parma. Um, before I introduce Professor Galese, I just want to say, um, as director of the Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society, which is hosting this, uh, this event, um, that we're really, really delighted to be able to collaborate in um, bringing Dr. Galese here um, with um, a pretty wide range of entities on campus who we're very delighted to collaborate with. The, you know, foremost among which is uh, the Department of Italian Studies, um, but also the Townsend Center for the Humanities, the Department of Slavic Languages and Literature, the Department of Scandinavian, Scandinavian Studies, and within our center, of course, the Office for History of Science and Technology. So I want to thank all of you for um, helping make this possible. And um, just in, say a few words about Dr. Galesi, whose uh, CV is... Um, far too long to actually represent adequately here. Um, just to say that um, he is, um, in, in addition to being full professor um, of human physiology, he's also the coordinator of the PhD program in neuroscience at the University of Parma. Um, he has received numerous awards, including the 2010 Arnold Pfeiffer Prize for Neuropsychoanalysis from the International Neuropsy, uh, Neuropsychoanalysis Neuropsychoanalysis Society. Um, in 2002, many of you will already know this, he was a professor here at Berkeley in the Department of Neuroscience. Um, his very interesting, unique work focuses on the relationship between action, perception, and cognition. Um, and he is also very actively developing an interdisciplinary approach to questions of the embodied bases of intersubjectivity and social cognition. And that's, it's precisely that work on um, embodied experience, <laughs> on the body in aesthetic experience, that he is going to be talking uh, to us about today. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Galesi. Thank you so much for coming. This is what necktie are for. So thank you so much for uh, the nice introduction. Thank you, all of you, for coming and uh, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, as you may see, um, I decided to open my talk uh, with this uh, wonderful Paul Clay, which is um, probably telling metaphor of what I will uh, what I'm up to this afternoon, namely uh, an exercise of perilous balance. Let me start with this uh, question. Why do we need neuroesthetics? Why neuroesthetics? Um, as you probably know, one of the uh, ways uh, are currently available to study brain function is brain imaging. Brain imaging is an indirect measure of neural activity uh, basically what we do uh, is uh, infer that a given population of uh, uh, nervous cells are uh, relevant uh, and therefore more active in a given task. Uh, and what we are measuring is not actually neural activity, but what we are measuring is the blood flow, which uh, is uh, uh, normally increasing when the, the neurons uh, in a specific uh, uh, area of the brain are more active because uh, supposedly and hopefully they are task relevant. So we have these wonderful images. So there has been uh, uh, someone who has said, well, but after all, this is fashion. So one way of looking at these images is uh, like the contemporary version of uh, Wunderkammer. So uh, something which is uh, intrinsically beautiful, but uh, uh, whose meaning uh, is far from, uh, from clear. So neuroscience is nowadays uh, uh, targeting a variety of domains, not only aesthetics, uh, 
but we have neuroethics, neuroeconomics. Uh, so another legitimate question to be asked is, uh, are we dealing with a sort of neurohubris? I mean, uh, uh, are we going nuts? Uh, are we uh, believing that we can explain everything uh, uh, by merely scanning the brains of the people? So um, to elaborate uh, further uh, this issue, uh, one may add that uh, many scholars in the humanities believe that uh, a neuroscientific approach to aesthetics, uh, while unable to add anything new about art and aesthetics, may uh, eventually even do worse. Uh, that is, hinder if not even destroy the magic and wonder that uh, normally comes along uh, with our appreciation of art. Then I would like to ask uh, my um, fellow citizen, uh, Giuseppe Verdi, in help. Uh, I don't want to take this sentence, I don't want to uh, rely uh, on this sentence uh, in general. It may be very dangerous. It means uh, let's go back to the past and progress will ensue. This is not necessarily true. Actually, most of the time it isn't true. But in this particular case, it might be true. Let me tell you why. This is uh, one of my heroes. Why? Because Abby Warburg uh, uh, wasn't afraid uh, to, so to speak, contaminate himself with science. Actually, science played a major role uh, in helping him develop uh, uh, his ideas about, uh, uh, about art. Uh, when he was in Florence, one of the books he, 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 he read uh, with most passion was the real bestseller of uh, uh, Darwin, The Expression of the Emotion in uh, Man and Animals. Uh, he saw in Darwin's book the possibility to enlarge art history, to include the transmission of emotions in pictures. And Varbo's copy of the book is inscribed, literally, finally a book that helps me. So, according to Varbo, a theory of artistic style must be conceived as uh, a pragmatic science of expression. I pragmatische Ausdruckskunde, pardon my German. Uh, so, he uh, relied heavily on contemporary science, namely, he relied heavily on the discoveries uh, that were piling up uh, in Germany uh, by uh, uh, several uh, distinguished uh, uh, scholars, uh, particularly physiologists like uh, uh, Richard Salmon. So the notion of name and the notion on, of engram, of uh, mnemic trace, was literally borrowed by the writings of uh, uh, this German physiologist who is Richard Salmon. Uh, let me briefly touch uh, 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 the issue of Pathos Foreman. So what, has, uh, uh, what are Pathos Foreman in Barbu's account? There are a variety of bodily postures, gestures, and actions that can be constantly detected in art history from classic art to the Renaissance period. And why is that? Because they embody in an exemplary fashion the uh, aesthetic act of empathy as one of the main creative sources of artistic style. Okay, after this brief uh, a parenthesis, let's switch back to uh, contemporary times. So aesthetics and neuroscience uh, can lead to a variety of possible solutions. So one possible way to go is this one. Uh, this is a paper that came out uh, very recently, last year, by uh, uh, a very uh, uh, well-known and distinguished uh, neuroscientist. Actually, I think Samir Zeki, together with Jubel and Wiesel, uh, is the neuroscientist who helped us uh, most to understand how the visual part of our brain works. He's very well known in, uh, in Berkeley because he organized uh, several uh, uh, meetings at the uh, local uh, uh, Contemporary Art Museum. I was there in 2005, perhaps. Uh, so one possible way to go is what he's up to, namely to locate in the brain uh, the sense of beauty. 
which is what reportedly uh, 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 he's referring uh, in, in this paper. So they were uh, having their volunteers in the brain scanner, uh, watching uh, famous uh, uh, masterworks, paintings, listening to music, Chopin, I don't remember exactly. And oh, what they were trying to do is uh, uh, to verify whether uh, there was a correlation between the aesthetic judgment that participants gave to the artworks they were beholding or listening to and the activation uh, in a, a given uh, regions of the brain. And apparently it turns out that uh, this particular region uh, in the mesial part uh, of uh, the frontal lobe, the uh, ventromesial orbitofrontal cortex, uh, uh, activated the more, the more they rated as aesthetically beautiful what they were looking at or what they were listening to. This is not my uh, uh, research agenda. I am on a, a different, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, wavelength. I think they are both complementary. Uh, what really uh, dragged me into aesthetics uh, is uh, the possibility to use uh, cognitive neuroscience to study the functional relationship between our brain-body system and aesthetic experience. Why? Well, this is a quote from a recent article that uh, Giorgio Agamben published in the Italian newspaper La Repubblica, a very nice article on the religion of money. And uh, he was concluding uh, uh, this article with this statement, l'archeologia, non la futurologia, è la sola via d'accesso al presente. So if you want to understand our present, we don't need futurology, but we should stick to archaeology. Why I think this is relevant? Because I tend to interpret what I'm doing, cognitive neuroscience, as a sort of cognitive archaeology. Cognitive archaeology in a variety of, of meanings. Uh, cognitive archaeology because uh, by studying uh, animal models of the human brain, like the, uh, the brain of non-human primates, uh, we have a key uh, uh, to address uh, the topic of phylogeny how we came to evolve a brain-body system enabling the kind of mind uh, uh, that we all have and use. Uh, archaeology uh, uh, in a perhaps even more interesting sense because uh, one can uh, think, as I do, uh, that it is always possible to deconstruct complex entities into uh, uh, simpler uh, uh, entities that are more uh, amenable to empirical, uh, to empirical research. And in that respect, aesthetic experience, I think, is crucial for uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience uh, because it provides an ideal way of studying the variety of worlds that we inhabit. I, I am a materialist, so I do believe that this is real. I do believe that outside there are trees, uh, there is a sky, which by the way is not blue, and uh, uh, the grass is not green. It is green uh, and, and blue uh, 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 for me, but not for my cat, Lucino, for example. Uh, I do believe in a material world, but I think we are constantly inhabiting a variety of intermediate worlds. And the intermediate world, which is constituted by what we call aesthetic experience uh, is very interesting because uh, it provides a prototypical case uh, to understand also the other varieties of worlds that we, from which we switch on and off constantly in our uh, daily transaction with reality. There is a further element of interest for someone like me in addressing the topic of uh, uh, aesthetic experience uh, uh, from the vantage point of cognitive neuroscience because uh, aesthetics is a mediated form of intersubjectivity. So in other words, the artwork acts as a sort of mediator between uh, 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 a variety of individuals. The artist on the one hand uh, and the beholder of the people who uh, have uh, uh, um, a more passive 
uh, uh, relationship w with the artwork, uh, which is not passive at all, uh, uh, as we will see in a minute. But at the very least, uh, who are not directly involved in the first place in creating the artwork. They might be involved in recreating it in their own uh, experience. Here is another contemporary uh, uh, Italian philosopher who is, uh, unlike uh, Agamben, very little translated in English, uh, uh, with the only exception of his political writings uh, uh, on, on radical thought. This is a quote from his uh, bo last book, E Così via all'infinito, which is a book uh, that specifically focuses on language, where he writes, uh, I, I, I took the liberty of, of uh, translating it into English, it is legitimate to postulate the existence of an original intersubjectivity which is anterior to formation of distinctive individual subjects. The human mind, contrary to what one might deduce from the methodological solipsism of the cognitive sciences, is originally public or collective. When uh, Vierno refers to this public or collective dimension, he, he speaks of comune, common, the common or the pre-individual. Uh, I think that uh, in many respects, uh, this is not to flatter uh, an audience of scholars in the humanities. I really mean uh, uh, what is in this light. Uh, I think art very often uh, uh, anticipates uh, uh, science. And I think uh, this quote from Dante Purgatorio uh, uh, makes uh, uh, quite nicely the case. Uh, Dante is addressing, uh, I believe, Folchetto da Marsiglia, and uh, he attributes uh, uh, to uh, one of the inhabitants of uh, the Purgatorio a distinctive feature that uh, clearly uh, Dante uh, believes to be precluded uh, to uh, living uh, embodied uh, human beings. The faculty, the possibility uh, to uh, have a direct access to the other, and he, he conveys this meaning with the, this incredible creative usage of the Italian language, turning the word to a me into verbs. Uh, I wouldn't wait for your question, si o min tu assi come tu ti me. The point I want to make is that this is uh, by all means not an exclusive uh, prerogative of uh, holy souls. So in other words, we don't need to wait to go to heaven or uh, at the very least uh, to the mountain of uh, Purgatorio, but we can do it uh, uh, even here. We do it all the time. We have a direct way of accessing uh, uh, the mind uh, of the other individuals. And one, one component of this uh, capacity uh, is uh, enabled, is allowed by the fact that we have in our brain-body system neural mechanisms that uh, do activate not only when we do something, but also when we see someone else doing the same. So um, this is um, a cartoon rendition of, of me or of one of my colleagues while we are grasping a piece of apple in front of a monkey which in turn grasped uh, the, the piece of food uh, uh, herself. And what we see, these uh, 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 short lines, each of these short lines is an action potential. So it's a spike fired by that very same neuron, both when the action uh, is performed by the monkey, but also when the action is observed being performed by someone else. So let's leave the monkey business and turn to the human brain. And so basically, to very quickly recap what we, we think we understood in the last 20 years, we discovered them in the July of uh, 1991. And uh, uh, next uh, August, the end of August, we will have uh, an international meeting in Erice, in Sicily, uh, just to uh, see where, where are we uh, 20 years after the publication of the very first paper. So what we understood so far is that the same cortical sites, in, also in our brain, which are these uh, uh, colored in this lateral uh, cartoon of a lateral view of the human brain, the same cortical sites are activated during the execution, but also during the observation of 
object-directed actions, grasping objects, biting uh, uh, apples, kicking footballs, and so much so forth, communicative actions, or body movements, apparently totally meaningless body like, like dancing, for example. Uh, that was the beginning of, of, of a story that it's uh, in progress. So um, this mirror mechanism not only applies to the domain of action, but also applies to the domain of emotion and sensations. So there are other regions in our brain that are activated when we experience a given emotion, like, for example, disgust or fear, or when we uh, experience uh, sensations like pain or touch, but the very same brain regions are also active when we witness those very same emotion and uh, sensation being experienced by, by someone else. So I put forward this, this theory, the theory of embodied simulation, which was an attempt uh, to provide a unified theoretical uh, framework that uh, may account uh, in a unified way of this variety of uh, mirroring mechanisms that we have been, we and other uh, uh, colleagues uh, have been uh, uh, detecting uh, in the human brain in the last 10 to 15 years. So what is embodied simulation? Embodied simulation is a basic functional mechanism which uh, we take to play a role in social cognition. As we have seen briefly, not confined to the domain of action, but encompassing also other aspects of uh, which characterize intersubjectivity, such as emotion and sensation. I have to add something here. I mean, I'm treating action, emotion, and sensation as separate domains. This is clearly false. I mean, every action I perform, or every action I witness being performed by someone else, is always characterized by an affective content. Why, then, am I speaking of action, emotion, and sensation if, as, as if I, I were referring to separate domains. This is the outcome of our peculiar approach. Our methodological reductionism uh, make us think that at this stage of our investigation, of our empirical investigation, it is better to study not social cognition as it really is, but in a way, you may think we are studying, uh, we are making up a sort of uh, a gross caricature of social cognition, which, however, makes this complex entity more amenable uh, to the empirical investigation. The only point uh, that one should bear in mind is be being aware that what I'm showing you is not the real thing. It's the outcome of a um, methodological approach which feels uh, the necessity to reduce the complexity, but with the ultimate goal to, uh, as our understanding of these things develop, trying to uh, go back uh, to the real level of description which matters, which is the personal level of description. So I'm studying neurons not because uh, a neuron freak, but because I think that studying neurons uh, make me understand something new offers me a new perspective to address the ultimate goal which should be also that uh, we all share in this room which is to understand who we are what, what does it mean to be a human being you do it with your own technicalities I'm doing it with my own technicalities but we are uh, ultimately we we have uh, we share the same goal and it I think it is very important that we keep talking to each other because I learned a lot from you since my ultimate goal is to go back to the personal level of description and neurons don't think, don't dream, don't love, don't hate, that's a prerogative of the personal level of description. By perhaps pre in, in, in a presumptuous way, I think that uh, breaking up the personal level of description and investigating disgust, passion, uh, love, uh, envy, uh, uh, at a level that can be uh, described in subpersonal, uh, at, at a subpersonal level, when coming back uh, 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 to the personal level of description, I can tell you something new that might be possibly relevant even uh, 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 for 
uh, people like you who, whose main goal is to understand this personal level of description, studying art, literature. So because of a shared bodily representational format, I have mirror neurons, you have mirror neurons, we map the actions of others onto our own motor representations, as well as others' emotion and sensation onto our own visceromotor and sensory motor representation. So both self and other appear to be intertwined because of the intercorporeality that links self to other. So intercorporeality describes a crucial aspect of intersubjectivity because we and others share the same intentional objects and our situated motor system are similarly wired to accomplish similar goals. Which of course, it doesn't imply that the way I am looking at this bottle is identical to the way you are looking at it. Actually, colleagues of mine and our group uh, are starting to factor out, to investigate specifically the enormous inter-individual variability. And there are very interesting experiments showing that uh, if two group of people look at the very same images, the video of your partner displaying a painful expression, even if at the cognitive level they accomplish the very same result, so they are equally capable of rating the unpleasantness uh, and the intensity of the pain being experienced by their partner they are watching in the video, they do it, they accomplish these cognitive results by activating completely different uh, brain circuits. So people who uh, we could define them phobic prone do activate, for example, the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, while individuals that um, overall, because of their personality profile, we could technically define eating disorder prone, so they are not anorexic, they are not phobic, but if eventually they will uh, suffer something in their life that will lead them to turn into psychopathology, the eating disorder prone do not absolutely activate the insula. They activate very much, a lot more visual areas in the back of their brain, the precuneus, uh, the prefrontal cortex, but no insula, no anterior cingulate uh, cortex at all. So this huge, uh, so the relevance of my individual personal history is something that neuroscience uh, is only beginning to address as we speak. Okay. Uh, many of your colleagues are becoming interested in learning more about neuroscience. Here is one example. Patrick Colm Hogan, his last book, What Literature Teaches Us uh, About Emotion. And so, you see, I mean, here we have another perspective. So, I want to learn about emotion, I do neuroscience. But if I want to learn about emotion, I can do uh, uh, literary studies because probably it's one may think and probably uh, I think uh, it, it, it's fair to say so I can learn a lot more about uh, uh, what uh, it is like to be a human being reading Karamazov than reading a pile of fMRI papers uh, however why do we still want to do uh, fMRI studies because we add another perspective and the more perspective we have, I think, the better we are in learning something more about who we are. So Hogan, uh, uh, in the beginning of his book, also writes, uh, with respect to verbal art, we enjoy simulation. The existence of literature itself, the systematic simulation of emotional experience. This is one aspect of literature which is poignant, very important, according to Hogan. Uh, here is uh, another quote from Amy Copland. Uh, in 2004, um, she published this paper on the role of empathy in the Journal of Aesthetics and Art Criticism, where she wrote, empathic perspective taking is a standard part of readers' engagement with fictional narratives. Uh, and one of the main reasons why I'm here is because I, had, uh, I was so lucky to meet uh, this colleague of yours, uh, Hannah Chappelle Wachowski, who is professor of English at Austin uh, University. Uh, uh, and uh, together uh, we wrote a paper that you might read uh, online, in, uh, just came out, in California Italian Studies, where we try to
to chart the territory uh, and see uh, to which extent uh, the combination of an English scholar and a cognitive neuroscientist can shed new light on literature on the one hand and on the human mind on the other. But I won't touch uh, 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 what, um, what we wrote in this paper because I have no empirical result to show you. And without empirical result, I feel uh, uh, kind of naked. <laughs> I mean, I feel embarrassed. So I will tell you more about visual arts where we do have indeed uh, a few new uh, empirical results. So our relationship with images, according to some colleagues, uh, one shouldn't even talk about images. There are people who claim that images do not exist. But anyway, that, that would uh, lead us way too far. So uh, I think it is an undisputable truth that uh, the relationship between an image and the beholder is a manifold. Okay? So the term aesthetic experience refers to a multi-layered state in which several dimensions can be distinguished. And one big mistake of cognitive neuroscience would be not to be aware of this multilayered nature of what an aesthetic experience is all about. So what I did recently uh, with a young colleague of mine was to try to dissect this manifold into uh, uh, simpler dimensions. And if we want to study the neural correlate of aesthetic experience, I think we should tap uh, onto this distinct layer uh, 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 and not uh, fuse them or confound them because otherwise we come up with uh, unintelligible results. So what uh, we tentatively distinguished was mere observation, that's trivial, aesthetic attitude, aesthetic experience, aesthetic appraisal, and aesthetic judgment. And I tend to believe that each of these single dimension taps into distinct activation of distinct uh, uh, neural uh, neural network, so to speak. Okay, I open my eyes, I look at the Golden Gate, okay, but I'm feeling my text form, okay? So that Golden Gate, the beautiful Bay Area, starts uh, 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 leaving, uh, um, uh, has an impact on my rods, my cones, uh, my ganglion cells, and all the way through uh, the visual pathway so the role investigated by Samir Zeki and, and, and other colleagues. Okay. So I have a piece of the physical world which has an impact on my visual system. Okay. Then the next day, uh, uh, the tax form is filled. I'm still sitting in the very same uh, chair, looking out, uh, seeing the Golden Gate at sunset. This time I turn on the stereo and I'm listening to David Crosby. Tamal Pais Hai, uh, from, if I could only remember my name, great, great, okay? So, great music. The picture is, the image is identical, but my experience of the Bay and of the Golden Gate is dramatically different. What does it mean? It means that there is substantial projective component in my experience of that image. So, how... I make sense of that image, it cannot be uniquely explained by charting a, a bunch of visual areas in my brain. So the aesthetic attitude is what was absent when I was feeling my tax form and was present when I was led to look at the bay uh, uh, um, being uh, driven by, by, by the music, uh, uh, by the West Coast music. So it is the implicit mindset enabling one to appreciate the aesthetic content of the contemplated object by focusing attention on its aesthetic qualities, which leads to aesthetic experience. Aesthetic experience, in turn, is the response to perceptual objects and, in, in, in my model, consists of the embodied simulation of the actions, emotion, sensations, that the content, if there is such a content, uh, the object evokes uh, in the beholder. It also activates memories that are related uh, to that, uh, to that um, very same object, which obviously will be different uh, uh, according to the different individual 
that is uh, uh, putting herself in that aesthetic mindset which leads uh, to that specific aesthetic experience. So such experience is, of course, not necessarily confined to the appreciation of artworks, although it grounds it. Let's move to aesthetic appraisal. By aesthetic appraisal, uh, uh, I'm, I mean the subjective evaluation of an object based on an introspective identification of the emotional and bodily responses to the object. So it is not necessarily the expression of a high-order cognitive consideration and mechanism, but might well be rather the, uh, uh, the outcome of association processes between the perceptual object and the beholder emotional memories once more. It basically answered the question, do you like it? And finally, we have aesthetic judgment, which is the explicit aesthetic rating of an object according to culturally and socially determined aesthetic canons. And it represents the most cognitive uh, aspect and the most socially constructed aspect of aesthetic experience. Uh, uh, it's the most cognitive way to establish a relationship uh, with the artwork, and basically it boils down to answering the question, is it beautiful, which uh, 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 can be uh, as different as different are the many cultures uh, that our species uh, was able to express. So we go to a museum uh, when uh, people are still uh, paying a, a few minutes of attention without taking a snapshot and running away. Uh, most likely, uh, these people photographed by, by Thomas Truth are uh, enjoying uh, an aesthetic experience like these other folks at the Art Institute of Chicago. But vision is a lot more than the activation of the visual brain. There has been so far a sort of uh, visual imperialism which has uh, uh, reduced all of our visual enterprises to the activation of the so-called visual part of the brain, which is illustrated in these two uh, cartoons, which are taken from standard uh, uh, neuroscience uh, handbooks. This is false, by the way. Observing the world and therefore also observing visual artworks is a much more complex enterprise than the mere activation of the visual brain because it implies a multimodal notion of vision. Observing the world encompasses the activation, as we have seen, of somatosensory, emotion-related components, motor components, within the more general frame of the intrinsic pragmatic nature of every intentional relation with the world. So to quote Heidegger, the world we live in is not exclusively vorhanden but is also most of the time zuhanden, ready to hand. So we are constantly enmeshed in a, a, a potentially pragmatic uh, uh, relationship with the world. Not only when I'm speaking about bottles or uh, glasses to be grasped, but even when I move my eyes around an object to appreciate uh, its uh, depth and, 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 and shape. So one crucial problem concerned the specific quality of aesthetic experience related to artworks. And uh, uh, David Friedberg, who is an art historian uh, at Columbia University, in the 80s wrote this book, The Power of Images, uh, which was really uh, a book uh, that was uh, totally out of the mainstream. Because uh, most of his colleagues were, when dealing with uh, aesthetic experience and art, we're talking about cognition. We're talking about concepts. While in this book, uh, uh, David uh, uh, was uh, vindicating uh, a very important role for emotions. And many years later, we got to know each other, uh, and we finally uh, wrote uh, a paper that was published in, in this journal, Trends in Cognitive Science, and by the way, David was uh, uh, really annoyed Then they, it was the time of the Da Vinci Code. And uh, uh, he was very annoyed uh, when he realized that they uh, decided to put the Mona Lisa <laughs> on the cover of the, um, um, of the journal. 
So what we said uh, uh, in this paper uh, is basically the following. First, a crucial element of aesthetic response to artworks consists of the activation of embodied mechanism that, as I said, encompass the simulation of action, emotion, and corporeal cessation. These mechanisms are, of course, socioculturally modulated, but here I'm uttering uh, in the, uh, a humanities-oriented environment uh, a, a five-letter words, uh, universal. So this basic level of uh, reaction to images uh, is supposedly essential to the understanding uh, of the effectiveness both of everyday images but also of works of art. So the first step we took was to uh, provide a sort of epoche. So if you want to understand what's going on when I have uh, an aesthetic experience uh, facing an artwork, first of all I should treat the artwork as an object in itself. So on top of its intrinsic artistic uh, qualities, there is something which uh, uh, the beholding of this object shares with the beholding also of uh, other objects which are not intrinsically uh, artistic. And the relevance of movement in uh, 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 visual aesthetics uh, is also a very old story. And allow me to quote briefly, uh, this is the Laocon, and Anna Wieczowski wrote a beautiful chapter in her last book on uh, group identity in Renaissance. And something I didn't, um, didn't know at all was uh, uh, through reading of her book to discover that the word gruppo, group, uh, didn't exist as such before they uh, were uh, able to dig out this marmorial group uh, 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 near Rome uh, in the Renaissance. There were other words referring to uh, uh, cohorts of people, but not group. Gruppo, which comes from groppo, which means not, uh, became uh, a, a, a commonly circulated word after the discovery of the Laocon. Nevertheless, here is Eisenstein on, towards the theory of montage. Here the model, referring to the uh, group, to the um, Laocon, appears to be perfect both in the face of external movement the attack of the snakes and in the crescendo phase of sufferance solved by the gradation of characters' behavior. He's trying to get rid of the snake. He's already uh, lost. But, continues Eisenstein, the most interesting thing of Laocon is the head of the central character. The fact is that the lived expression of human sufferance is obtained by the illusion of movement, and such illusion is achieved with a procedure representing the development of sufferance within a configuration he could not possibly show simultaneously. When we look at the static image of an, of an, of an action, we still do activate its motor representation. So uh, you don't need to see a moving hand uh, that grasps the bottle to evoke the embodied simulation of that motor acts. Also, uh, beholding the static image uh, of an uh, accomplished uh, action like uh, taking hold of a bottle of, uh, uh, of Coke leads to the activation of the hand motor representation in the brain of the observer. And the more dynamic is the static image, the more your motor brain activates as shown by this uh, EG recent study. But in principle, if this is true, and it is highly debatable that what I told you might be proven to be entirely true, uh, things go, may get even worse when there's nothing to resonate with, when there is no compianto sul Cristo morto, when there is no laucon, when there is no incredulity of Thomas uh, to be embodied. When we have uh, abstract expressionism, for example, Pollock, the Koenig, or we have Fontana, what do we resonate with here? So we decided to start exactly from, from here. Because I took it to be trivial, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, uh, to start with Caravaggio. 
although David continuously is telling me, uh, look, uh, I mean, uh, what, you are, uh, what we are saying is by no means trivial. Actually, uh, we got booed uh, when we normally address art historian making the story I, I'm, I'm telling you today. So most of the people don't, don't buy it. Uh, things. It's either irrelevant or it's false. So anyway, we decided, uh, I like high stakes, so we decided to start with Fontana. But again, this is not, uh, uh, by all means, a new idea. If you read this, uh, as an artist, I think it was negligible. But as uh, uh, someone who thought about aesthetics, much more interesting, uh, Adolf von Hildebrand, in this small book, played an enormous influence uh, in those times, the problem of form in figurative art. Creation and response to art are directly related to understand an artistic image means to implicitly grasp its creative process. Further, the aesthetic value of artworks would reside in their potential to establish a link between the intentional creative acts of the artist and their reconstruction on the side of the beholder. And once more Warburg, these engrams of emotional experience, the pathos foreman, survive as the inherited legacy of memory determining in exemplary mode the, count, the contour created by the artist's hand when the highest values of gestural language emerge in artistic creation by means of his hand. Okay, so the next point we made in the 207 paper, David and I, was the following. The felt effect of particular gestures involved in producing artworks constitutes a consistent component of our aesthetic experience and appreciation of artworks. So here is Lucio Fontana at work in his atelier, and here are the consequences of his uh, hand gesture, the cut. So what we did, we took a sample of uh, young adults, psychology undergraduate and medical undergraduates, we convinced them to wear this peculiar cap, which is a high-density EEG, 128 electrodes. And we had them to look into or to a, a video screen where we projected digitized uh, high-definition images of uh, Fontana cuts. And this work was mainly done by uh, Maria Alessandro Milta and Cristina Berchio, uh, with the help, of course, of David. So, blank screen, fixation cross, one second, uh, the visual stimulus appears, blank screen again for five seconds. Which stimuli? We, and by means of uh, EEG, what we were measuring was uh, uh, the sensory motor alpha desynchronization, which is an indirect fingerprint of the activation of your mirror neurons. So, Alpha desynchronization, when recorded on, uh, from central electrodes, uh, signifies that uh, your motor representation is being activated. Okay? So you are simulating uh, hand movements in your motor part of the brain. So we randomly alternated the uh, digitized uh, version of the original artworks of Lucio Fontana with photoshopped uh, modified version where simply the cut is replaced by uh, uh, a line which has the same width and the same length. At the end, the word art was never mentioned while we did uh, uh, this uh, EEG recording. What we said to all participants was try not to move, try to blink the less you can because <laughs> eye blinks brings in uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, motion artifacts, uh, look carefully what you will be seeing, period, okay? At the end of the uh, experiment, we asked them a lot of questions. How did you like, so we played again all the images, so the original and the control stimuli, asking them, how do you like it? Please rate these images, minus 10 ugly, plus 10 uh, incredibly nice. Uh, if and how much movement do you perceive in this image, in this static image, that to most of them seems a weird question to be asked. And finally, and most importantly, if and how 
Are you familiar with this image? It turned out that half of the people never heard of Lucio Fontana. Sadly, uh, they didn't know about Lucio Fontana. They never saw these images, while the other half did. And the results is the following. Only the condition effect was significant, namely, only during the observation of the original artworks we were able to measure a, a motor simulation in the brain of the beholders, most importantly, independently from stimulus familiarity. So we recorded the very same effect uh, in the people who knew Lucio Fontana, but also in those that didn't know anything about him. Okay, let me be very clear. My point is the following. If instead of showing cuts made by Lucio Fontana, I did the cut myself, we would have had the very same results. Okay? So the point is not that you induce in your brain a motor simulation only if what you are seeing is an artistic cut, which wouldn't possibly make any sense. What I'm saying is that whenever you see a cut, you simulate the gesture produced, uh, 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 executed to produce the cut. And this occurs whether you know that this is a cut or not, whether you know it is an artistic cut or not. So what? The point I want to make is that a consistent embodied aspect of my aesthetic experience when facing a Fontana is this effect. And the next point I want to make is that the emotion I may or may not derive from beholding this image is also partly due uh, to this embodied simulation that goes on in my brain as I'm facing Lucio Fontana. Uh, we also, I don't want to make a big point out of this, but I may add that aesthetic judgment was higher for the original uh, cuts with respect to uh, the control stimuli, again, regardless of familiarity. So the cuts on the canvas are the visible traces of goal-directed movements, hence capable of activating the relevant motor areas in the observer brain. So the idea is that the artwork becomes the mediator of the motor and emotional resonance which arises between the artist and the observer. And, and therefore, the sensory motor component of stimulus processing represent the most direct, by no means the unique, only the most direct fruition level, which allows the beholder to feel the artwork in an embodied manner. I would expect to see uh, the same effect if I show uh, a Van Gogh uh, with the uh, very uh, materic uh, uh, consequences uh, of the way uh, 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 he, he painted uh, the painting. Let me get quickly to the conclusions. What can neuroscience tell us does on aesthetic experience? I think it can help to rediscover the role of the acting body in intersubjectivity even if we are dealing with a mediated form of intersubjectivity, as I said uh, at the beginning. So embodied simulation generates the peculiar quality of the embodied scene as that I think plays a significant role in aesthetic experience, although it's only one component, as I said, of aesthetic experience. And I think it is one important ingredient of our appreciation of art. There's one last uh, aspect that I will not elaborate too much uh, today but uh, which I think might also be interesting at least to introduce uh, to you. How comes that quite often, although we had a discussion with my wife on this specific topic, she was not fully convinced that you can uh, make this statement all the time, but many people uh, believe in what I'm about to say, and namely that artistic fiction often is more powerful than real life in evoking our emotional uh, engagement and uh, empathic involvement. Why? 
Well, one way to go that I would like to only suggest, uh, because uh, uh, I'm, I'm out of time, perhaps because in aesthetic experience we temporarily suspend our grip on the world, and therefore we are capable of liberating new energies and put them into the service of a new dimension that paradoxically, as it may sound, can be more vivid than prosaic reality. So aesthetic experience of artworks can be described uh, as uh, a sort of suspension of disbelief, okay? We know it since, uh, who was it, Coleridge? But I would like to complement this cognitive side of aesthetic experience with a more, I, I'm an embodiment uh, uh, chap, so I always try to find something, uh, uh, not alternative, but uh, that can complement the most highly cognitive uh, description of anything related uh, 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 to human beings. Uh, and uh, so this uh, uh, embodied complement to suspension of disbelief is what, uh, in, in the paper with uh, uh, Hanna Wieczowski, we, we discussed it a little more uh, in detail. Uh, I call it liberated embodied simulation. If you think about it, when you read a novel, you are still, you are sitting. Well, with audiobook, maybe you can jog, but this is not the standard way people, at, at least until now, read uh, uh, books or novels. When you are at a museum, uh, you may move slightly backward and forward uh, uh, just to match your viewing angle with the light, but most of the time you are still. Similarly, you are still when you are sitting in a movie theater, when you are uh, attending to a theatrical play, to a, uh, a dance performance. And this is very important. You are still, so which means that uh, you can um, somehow loosen your guard, your defense mechanism. When you are on a subway, you may well witness some passionate love uh, example, people kissing each other, people telling each other uh, loving words, or you may uh, witnessing a fight. But if you witness the fight, you might easily become all of a sudden part of that plot. You stare at the guy, you're looking at me, you're looking at me, <laughs> and all of a sudden you find yourself punch on your face. So this trivial example is telling you that uh, we are inhabiting a totally different world we, when we uh, are having an aesthetic experience. Uh, we actually uh, were able to build a very specific environment. Uh, if you think about ancient Greek theater, there is always a, a safety distance between where the uh, theatrical action goes on and when uh, the audience is sitting. So this physical distance uh, multiplies the possibility to uh, allocate more bodily resources in the fruition of what you are beholding. So we look at art from a distance of safety from which our being open to the world gets magnified. So in, in that respect, I think that to appreciate art means leaving the world behind while simultaneously enjoying the possibility to more fully grasp it. And I end with a, another totally non-actual <laughs> uh, quote from Lichtenberg. Uh, so we are back to physiognomy, but I think uh, um, physiognomic, but I think uh, it tells you something very modern. Uh, our body stands in between our soul and the external world, mirroring the effects of both. And I think cognitive neuroscience can rediscover this truth, uh, although from a, a totally different uh, uh, point of view. Thank you. <laughs>